I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI. We're on a mission to make innovators change the world by giving them access to government funding and resources to succeed. This webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Founder Institute, BCF Ventures, Lazaridis Institute and Growth Blazers. Super excited here for today's session. Uh, our serial entrepreneur and one of the top, top technology entrepreneurs I know first came to traction in 2018, I think, after he sold his previous company, App Dynamics, which provided software engineers insights into code performance. And App Dynamics was acquired by Cisco for 3.7 billion. And the funny story there was Jyoti was the closing keynote speaker, and he was running a little late. And TechCrunch Frederick asked Jyoti that <laughs> after such a big acquisition, are you still flying coach or are you flying private? But um, one of the most humble people I've met in my life, a super humble entrepreneur. Today he's the founder and CEO of high, two high growth technology companies, Harness and then Traceable AI. Harness was recently valued at 1.7 billion. And then Jyoti also founded Unusual Ventures to bring the experience that he had and his team had, as well as capital to early stage technology companies. And they have already in a short amount of time, 600 million under management. Jyoti has received Forbes Best Cloud Computing CEO to work for, Best CEO by San Francisco Business Times and Entrepreneur of the Year. So he, Jyoti is a, has a BS in computer science from IIT. If people are not familiar with IIT, it's probably one of the top universities for engineering on the planet. It's actually harder to get into IIT than it is to get into I, MIT. And Jyoti has more than 25 patents under his name. Jyoti, thanks for joining us. How's 2021 going for you? Well, 2021 better than 2020. So, uh, uh, you know, great to be uh, chatting with you again. Uh, it was a few years ago uh, than when we first chatted uh, on a, you know, uh, on a, in, a, in a forum or a discussion like this. It's, you know, it's 2020 and the last uh, 15, 17 months have been uh, strange and hard and, uh, um, but as as humans, we survive through it and we adapt and we change. So you know, I'm 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 excited and uh, uh, bullish about the the new post pandemic uh, future. Yeah, definitely. Pain is the precondition for growth. Yeah. Um, walk us through your background. I mean, I gave a quick overview of you, but how did you get into entrepreneurship? You you super smart. It's almost impossible to get into IT, and then. You got into entrepreneurship, did App Dynamics, sold it, and now you have a number of ventures. Give us your background. Sure. So my background, I grew up in a small town in, in India, in, in uh, Rajasthan, which is the northwest part of India. You know, my dad had, over there had a small mom and pop kind of a shop and a business. So I grew up watching business and looking at business. A lot of people in my family, my uncles and cousins, and I, they all had these small mom and pop shops and businesses. So I was always fascinated by business. I I also like tech and technology and math and science. So you know, I tried to get into IIT, got in there, studied computer science. So to me, it was a perfect combo. Like, you know, business and technology is what I, I the two things I kind of liked as a when I was growing up. So after IIT, I was, uh, you know, most people at that time would normally go and, you know, get a master's degree or go for PhDs and all. And, you know, I was fascinated by startups. And so I, I wanted to come to Silicon Valley and work in startups. And, you know, it's, uh, so I, I just started applying to different startups in Silicon Valley and one of them eventually hired me and I, I came here. And my plan was that I would work in startups, you know, uh, you know, as one startup or two startups for a few years learn like, you know, how do they work and then start my own uh, because I was just fascinated by entrepreneurship, startups and, and tech in, in general. It took a little bit longer than I thought because, you know, I, I came here on a visa, on a work visa and, uh, you know, on a work visa, you come here, you are not allowed to start a company. It's just kind of ridiculous that you are not allowed to, but so you, you have to wait until you get a green card, you know, to do that. So, you know, uh, I waited for that and, you know, I had no shortage of ideas or problems I wanted to solve and App Dynamics was the, the the first one I got excited, very excited about, and I started that. That's amazing. You sold App Dynamics, 
and then you got into a number of ventures, but you started Unusual first, right? Did Unusual come first or did Harness come first? first? Harness came first. Yes, so give, give us the background because it's very interesting. I, you know, I often wonder, like I, I'm, I'm struggling to catch the bus after the 23 million raise and you got Harness mm -hmm. and you got Traceable, you got Unusual Ventures. How do you do it all? How did you come up with this concept? <laughs> well, um, it all comes down to like, you know, what you enjoy and like to do. So after AppDynamics was sold, I was in this kind of, a, let's say, uh, figuring out more of what do I want to do? Like, uh, and initially my first thought was I should retire. I don't need to work anymore. Uh, you know, this, I was fortunate enough. There was plenty of, uh, you know, money uh, that I made with the Abdanamis acquisition. And I tried to retire. That was the first thing. So I actually retired for about six months and I have a big list of things on like, you know, I wanted to go to um, Africa for a safari and wanted to hike Machu Picchu and wanted to go to Bhutan and see the fjords in Norway and all that list was done in six months. And after six months, I was like, okay, I need to do something that I, I'm just not ready to retire fully. And what I realized is like, I like two things. I like building companies and it's hard. Building companies is hard. Building products is hard. You know, you, you struggle in the market, you find, you know, you compete, you have to do all sort of things in the startup journey, but I enjoy it. I enjoyed it in AppDynamics. So why won't I do it again if I enjoyed it? Uh, so that's that one thing I, it was pretty clear to me that that's mm -hmm. something I really, really like to do. The second thing I also realized is that, you know, I like to help other founders, you know, other, big, uh, other founders who are going through similar kind of journeys, like, you know, help them in whichever ways, like, you know, with my experience, my lesson, you know, some guidance, mentorship through investing. Uh, so that's what I thought, like, can I find a model where I can do both? And, you know, and obviously I started with, start, you know, building, uh, building the, the, building new companies in areas I'm very excited and passionate about. But then, uh, you know, eventually I also co-founded Unusual Ventures with my partner, John uh, Virianis there, so that we can create this kind of a model to, uh, to, to help founders at the earlier stages, right? How do I do it all? It really comes to having the right people as your partners and your, your key leaders and team members. You know, it's, it, that's what allows to you know, to, to scale. So I, I look at like, you know, the only, the only two secrets, one is that, you know, only do things that you enjoy. Like it's, 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 if you're doing it for purposes, you know, which is like, you know, you don't enjoy it, you're doing it. So you gain something and then you will enjoy your life. Then it's hard to keep going. You know, to me, this is what I enjoy. Like, you know, I could be doing this until I'm eight years old. Like, you know, I love doing this. And, um, Second is having the right people. If you have right people as partners in your team, it just becomes easy. Definitely. I think uh, you know, the, the job of a great leader is to build, inspire, and motivate a team to deliver. That's what I've consistently heard, right? If you, if you find the right people, it makes uh, magic happen. So let's, uh, let's go into this. You built AppDynamics. How long did it take AppDynamics to get to a billion in valuation? Because, on, because <laughs> for Harness, it seemed uh, very quick. Yeah. Um, App Dynamics, it took about, uh, I would say seven years to get to a billion in valuation and, um, Harness, it was much faster. Harness, it was about four years and, you know, we are on a much faster trajectory and, you know, there's some advantage of doing it the second time that you kind of know what's, what's coming. Uh, you can execute, uh, you know, a bit better you get, uh, but also the time has changed. You know, when I was doing AppDynamics, you know, now this was uh, like uh, early 2010s, getting to 100 million ARR was, a, uh, you know, let's say a, a bit harder than if you're doing it today, getting to 100 million ARR. Because the, the markets for like, you know, software, uh, just, you know, software and technology have grown. You know, the execution models have matured more, you know, you could do much more with, uh, you know, less number of people, you know, it's the, there's just much more efficiency in, in the, in, in, in everything uh, that you could, you, there is the opportunity to grow faster now. And like, you know, at, at, um, at when I was doing AppDynamics, uh, a billion dollar was like this, like this ultimate magic number. Like if you get to a billion dollar valuation, that was like the, the biggest achievement you could get in the startup world. You know, it's not that anymore. <laughs> now it's like, you know, if you don't, now there's, because it's, it, it's possible to be decacons and it's possible to be $10 billion, $20 billion companies. So if you like the, the very, very best of the startups now, the, the, the bar has moved there now, right? So, so it's, which is great for the entire startup ecosystem. 
that the bar is is higher you know uh it's you could build even bigger companies than a billion dollar value company that's you know that was used to be the bar eight years ago ten years ago i think there's one law there right uh, they often say in product yesterday's uh, performance feature becomes today's uh, or yes, yesterday's wow feature becomes today's performance piece feature and becomes yeah. tomorrow's table stake. So I yeah. think next year, one billion is a table stake. Otherwise, <laughs> you're a lifestyle business. They'll start telling people. Uh-huh. But, but, the, but the other thing is, you know, you had some key lessons you probably learned at App Dynamics uh-huh. change the way you operate uh, your ventures right now, right? And, and probably mm-hmm. one thing that doesn't, uh, probably not one of the factors, but if you ask most people, what accelerated digital transformation in their companies at the enterprise level? The answer by far is COVID. So COVID <laughs> has, has made some of that uh, adjustment too. But what did you do differently this time? What did you learn from App Dynamics that you know you said I'm not going to do it, and it gave you some speed? I think the biggest lesson I learned uh, from App Dynamics, and yet, uh, you know, App Dynamics. I was first time founder. I started and I, when I was in my late twenties. I, when I started App Dynamics, I never managed a single person before. I was a, you know, I was an engineer and architect uh, 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 there in my in my startup jobs before. So I knew tech, I knew product, but I didn't knew the rest of like, you know, how do you manage people? How do you recruit people? How do you build business? How do you do, you know, go to market sales, all sorts of things. Like, and how do you build a company? And so there was a lot of learning that happened on the job as I went through it, right? So, but when I simplify, you know, when I look at like, you know, okay, if I just have to summarize all the learnings and I have to use it in my next company harness, what is the summary of it? And to me, it came down to like, you know, a sim- I call it a very simple formula. It's my simple five point formula. A simple five point formula is, uh, there are five things to it. One is you have to make sure your market is large. Your addressable market that you are going after is not very, very small. Uh, and you are constantly working to make it larger. And that's the second part of this, 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 you're working on it to make it larger is very important that you start with something and you keep expanding it and expanding and expanding and expanding it. So you're, the, the market need is getting bigger and bigger. It's not getting smaller every year. So that's the first part of the, the, the formula that you have to find that, that the market need is getting bigger every year. And the second part is you got to shoot to build the best product in your market, like in the, at least in the top three. You know, um, if it's you know, it's that in the it, if it's in the top three products in whatever the problem space you are in, everything becomes much much simpler and easier to execute on. And so that's really the second part of the formula. The third part of the formula is very top notch uh, sales execution. So the you know, many times you could have a large market, really best product in the market, but your sales ex- you didn't focus on sales execution. And you know, a lot of founders who come from product and engineering background, like uh, you know, like I did. We don't know sales and marketing and we don't know how to execute on sales and we kind of undervalue it also and not put the right effort and energy into it. So that is really is completely wrong. As a company, you have to excel that sales execution, you know, is your strength in, in many ways, in addition to building the best product in the market. So you have to combine that. The fourth is uh, take care of your customers, like and obsess with taking care of your customers. If you acquire a customer, just take care of them. And, you know, every business likes to say it, but you just like, you know, I like to believe in that you just have to obsess with it. Uh, and fifth is is the culture. Like you have to put a lot of focus on the right culture in the company, where you bring you know that the culture is uh, is open, collaborative, transparent. People like to work there. People like to thrive there, etc. Right. And that's it. Like if you get these five things right, everything will happen. That's how I think of it. So when I look at my building other companies, I I, I put my lens with these five. Like and I gotta focus on that at a, at a macro level. These five are. Are we meeting these or not? And I tell every employee in the company, by the way, everyone we hire, I tell them, okay, these are the five things. And if you think we are not doing a good job in any of these, or we are starting to get in a bad place on any of these, we should talk about it. Let me know, let any, everyone know, we should have debate and discussions on, on that. But that's really the formula from my learning, some app dynamics that I'd like to bring into Harness and Traceable and other companies. This is fantastic, actually. I kind of want to throw the questions I had uh, curated and I've dive into it, dive into these. <laughs> this, is, this is way more yeah, interesting. Yeah, why not? Let- let, let's try, start with the large TAM here, right? You said constantly working to uh, make the TAM bigger. Now, mm-hmm. a lot of people, they have this, especially engineers, I'm an engineer too. We have this shiny object system syndrome, right? We, you, there's something else comes up. You, you say you're working on a focused market, but maybe an enterprise deal comes up and then you run there and something. Mm-hmm. How do you like focus on a TAM, but also 
and make it larger, but also stay focused because as an early company, you could completely kill yourself by running in different directions, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to do run in different directions. You want to start with the TAM of a use case or some some use case or some segment. Like you can slice it by like, you know, by a use case, by a market segment, by like, you know, SMB versus enterprise, by industry vertical, whatever you care about, right? And you got to do a very, very good job at that. Once you do that, then you expand the time to the next segment, use case, uh, vertical. When you, then you do that, you have to keep expanding to the third use case, vertical segment, whatever it is, and then the fourth one. So you, that's how you are expanding. But you have to do a good job in each one of those. If you're not doing a good job in those and you kind of chase the you did your, your job is half done in the first use case and you chase the second one and you did 20% of the work there. And then you chase the third one and you did 10% of the work there and you chase the fourth one. That's totally wrong. So you got to get one thing right and then keep moving to it. So the, the formula that I have roughly used in at, at Abdanomics and uh, at Harness also now, at any point of time, about two third of your engineering investment and product investment goes into the existing time that we the, or the existing uh, use cases or or TAM that you're addressing. And one third goes into expanding your TAM. Uh, so, and uh, you know, the one third that you're putting this year to expand your TAM will become next year part of your, ex, uh, your existing TAM now, right? And then the year after, you know, the, there will be new one third that you will invest in putting TAM. So that's the rough rule of thumb I've mostly followed. Like, you know, so you still have to put two third in your existing TAM and then the rest goes into expanding the, to the, to the, to the, to the, you, you know, you're getting your time bigger. Definitely. Now at App Dynamics, by the time you sold, um, what percentage of the company was the product you started with, and and what percentage was new products, sort of thing? Like, uh, did you yeah. expand? Did you add significant new products, new features? Like, what did that look like by the time? Yeah, you yeah, we definitely did. So when you know, it's App Dynamics was about you know monitoring and troubleshooting your software applications when uh, like you know it was like monitoring diagnostic troubleshooting systems for all kind of software apps. So we started by very by focusing initially on apps written in Java as a programming language. So that was like you know if if you if you have an app written in Java, we are the we were the best monitoring and troubleshooting product, and we focused on that for and. Once we did a good job at it, then we started expanding to other programming languages, you know, .NET and PHP and Python. And, you know, so that's how we expanded the TAM systematically on there. But then once we did that, we started moving to like, you know, beyond your code, can we watch your databases and what's the impact of performance, uh, you know, and, or like, do you need monitoring and diagnostics for those? Do we, can we monitor your mobile devices and put the monitoring and diagnostics on those? So that's how you keep expanding our TAM, right? So by the time we sold the company at that time, you're around, uh, uh, I would say around around 250 million ish uh, in in uh, you know in in business, and of for 250 out of 250 million, the original product which was our Java application monitoring and troubleshooting, that was about 50 to 60 percent of the of the revenue, and the other 40 50 percent was coming from the 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 areas that we expanded into, but now is actually App Dynamics business in, is which was acquired by Cisco is is around uh, 750 800 million of revenue as part of Cisco. And a lot of that has come from the products we are building, the newer products we are expanding into as well, right? So that allows you to fuel a lot of growth. And that's the main, you know, at, at Harness, we do the same thing. Like, you know, you, you start with one area and one use case and you do extremely good job at it. Then you keep adding to the next and the next and the next and next. Your time keeps growing and you're, you know, you get the cross-sell, uh, you know, opportunity, you get the upsell opportunities, you get like, you know, you become from a product to a platform. And you know it drives high growth and it drives efficiency in the business as well because the cost of selling you know more to your existing customer is is much lesser than finding a brand new customer. Right? And then, did your customer base change at all? Like when I say change, meaning what, you were I think at App Dynamics going after enterprise. Did that mm -hmm. profile or, or change over time, or stayed more or less the same? Selling more, basically upselling versus going to net new. Yeah, well, the profile changed over time, yes. Uh, you know, when we started at AppDynamics, we were selling to both SMB and enterprise. And our business was like a good mix of mix of both. Over time, our business shifted more towards enterprise and, you know, uh, less towards SMB. And we put our more of our energy and focus on, on enterprise. And with enterprise, like, you know, if we, as we're building and expanding our product portfolio, you know, if, an, if, 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 you have a, if you have a large enterprise as, as a customer and is happy with your product number one, and you have an adjacent product number two, it's really easy to sell to them. And, you know, if, if they're happy with that, you have a new adjacent product number three, you can sell that. 
So then we started, you know, our focus shifted more and more towards enterprise uh, over time. At Harness, you know, my new company, that's one thing I'm doing differently, that I'm actually making sure that we are always very good in addressing both segments. So we, you know, we are, and we are, we are, we have almost like a, a rough model that we are shooting for that about, you know, uh, 60, 65% of our business comes from enterprise, which is the, you know, large major, which is a majority of it, but we have 35, 40% of our business comes from the SMB market as well. So we, and so, you know, with, and the advantage of that is like, you know, you're, if you're also selling into SMB, you have to make sure your product is simple and easy for someone to get going in SMB fast. Uh, and to me, that is a very, very valuable thing that is also extremely helpful in large enterprises these days. So it it create it forces your your engineering and your product to design products that are simple and easy, and then you can ta- also take into large enterprise and the simple and easy creates higher velocity in your when you go to market. Definitely. Now your next point was build the best product in the market, right? How do you start? Like how should startups think about building products as they go from idea to product market fit? And then hyper growth. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a that's, that's that's a good question, and that's probably the 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 hardest thing to achieve. Like it's easy to say build the best product in the market, but how do you achieve it? Right? I, I look at it as like you know you just you just have to keep at it. Like you know you the the main thing is if you are in an existing market, which majority of the times company startups would be, you have to have a major binary differentiator in your product approach. Like when you launch the product, like if you don't have a binary differentiator, it's like, this is the thing that's fundamentally different compared to the, the current generation of products for this thing. It's very hard to for you to be the best product in there, right? So you build around those core binary differentiators. And I would not even launch the product until I have it figured out that what is the core binary differentiator? Like, you know, so to me, it's like that the entire product has to be built around that first. If you're going in a brand new market where there's not too many legacy uh, incumbents, that's a different one. That's to me, is like, you know, you just, it's, you're competing against nothing. That there's really nothing. It's a brand new market. You're trying to create it. So in that one, speed is important that you want to bring, you know, as much capabilities there uh, fast to the market because there is a pain and there is no incumbents to solve that right now. Right. So it's a little bit of a different product strategy. Like, you know, if it's a, uh, you know, if, if, if you're competing against existing incumbents in an existing market, you have to go with a very strong binary differentiator. There's no point launching the product unless you have a credible binary differentiator to start. If you, if you are going in a new market, optimize for speed, like bring something fast so that, you know, before other, others bring it uh, so you can start covering the gap and then kind of grow from there. Definitely. So did you have any sort of uh, metrics then? Because you also invest, right, at Unusual. Mm -hmm. So what are some metrics you say that the company has maybe product market fit Mm -hmm. or validated the market? Then like, you know, they're ready to scale. They have a differentiated product. What are Mm -hmm. some things you look for? What are those signals? Well, uh, Unusual, tell you a little bit about Unusual. So, you know, I started Unusual with this uh, primarily the concept of that when the when founders start their companies and normally it's like a small team you are like two three four people at that time you have some idea you have some expertise in your domain that you are very and you're passionate about some problem how do we help at that time you know and what i realized was like and when i started app dynamics you know i needed most help in the first 18 months, two years, like, you know, it was the engineer turned first time founder. I didn't know what to do in finding customers and marketing and recruiting. And like, you know, I needed a lot of help there and my VCs wouldn't provide help that time. They say like, I will wait until you get traction until you get, you know, we can't spend too much time with you until you get all of the, the traction. And by the time we got traction, we didn't need, I didn't need help because I knew what to do. So I, what I found was that the VC model was almost like inverted. Like the founders need most help when they're just starting before traction, before product market fit, before the, you know, that's where they need the most help. Once they have gotten those things, they really don't need as much help because they have learned it. They have figured out as founders, as entrepreneurs, as as CEOs, what to do. They have probably hired like VP of uh, different functions, VP of sales, VP of marketing. So they have a team that can help them do things. So do you really need help from investors at that point? So Unusual is designed to invert that, that we help you when you need the most help. When you're just starting, actually it's mostly pre-traction, pre-product market fit. So we invest when you're just starting, like, you know, it's, it's so, and uh, you know, we, 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 we call ourselves, we specialize in zero to one. So we invest you at, invest in you at zero and we kind of help you to take to one, like in, in, in a B2B world, it, it's actually literally zero to million dollars of revenue. Like, you know, we, we invest in you at zero dollars uh, of revenue 
and we really deeply help you get to your first million dollars of revenue, maybe million, million two. And after that, you know, you learn and you get mature and you, you know, we help you recruit the right team and you kind of run from there. So it's, it's, it's a different model. We, we, look, we don't look for metrics as much. What we look for is, are the founders really passionate about this problem? Is this problem large enough? Do the founders have a unique advantage and, and insight about that problem? Like, do they have some techn technology insight? Do they have some domain deep experience that they have the advantage to win to solve that particular problem? And are these founders, you know, committed to the long term to build something big, you know, in that? That's that's all we look for, you know, we, because we're normally investing in pre-product market fit and pre pre-traction at, at Unusual. When you look back to app dynamics and even harness, at what point did you say, I have product market fit? Let's, <laughs> let's pour some gasoline on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, product market fit is such a, is such a like I, I would say so much has been written about product market fit and talk about product market fit, but still is sort of abstract uh, uh, concept, right? So I normally like to divide into two phases of product market. We call it like early product market fit and a mature product market fit. To me, early product market fit, I only feel there is early product market fit at when you have at least hit a million or so of revenue. Uh, you know, it's it, by until a million of revenue or so, you are just kind of pushing it, you know, you figuring it out, you know, you're selling, you know, maybe around half, maybe somewhere in the 500K to a million dollars of revenue in the B2B world and consumer different metrics, let's say. Like, you know, the, the half a million to a million is probably when you start feeling, okay, you have early product market fit, like you can sell this thing, you know, there is the, the message is resonating, the product features, functionality are resonating, people are using it, people are buying it, right? So, so you know, you want, uh, so, you know, in, in the B2B kind of world that I've been in App Dynamics Harness Traceable, it roughly translates to about, say, you know, 20 to 40 customers. You have 20 to 40 customers who are using your product, they are finding value from it, you've been able to convince them to pay you money, you are in a close to a million-ish uh, ARR. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign that, you know, you have an early product market fit. Mm -hmm. A more, then there's, a, there's the, the mature product market fit. The, the, the main difference in a mature market freight is bringing the go-to market element into it. To get to the first half a million now to a million, you are just brute forcing the go-to market. You're finding the leads, whichever way you want. You're finding like, you know, your, your, your SDRs and BDRs and whatever marketing uh, functions are working. And you find, you're fi figuring out like, you know, is there a market and is there's your product solve that need? The, the, the second phase of it, the go-to market is very important. Like, you know, your product has to be designed to meet your go-to market. Like, do you have a freemium model? Do you have an open source strategy? Do you have a, like, you know, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a marketplace model? How do you drive your, uh, your growth? Right. And normally in my experience, that comes to like, you know, uh, you you have to feel confident that your go to market is 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 running that you figured out are you selling into enterprise or you're selling into SMB or what is the mix of enterprise to SMB are you figure out are you selling direct or you're selling through channels have you figured out are you gonna sell through like you know inside sales or field sales uh, you know and uh, all of those things which is like the go to market part and that you know people think of go to market and product independently that's not how it works in modern software companies in in my experience now. So you have to bring the your go-to market strategy and your product market fit. And that's when you have a mature product market that fit that you've figured out, like, this is how we generate leads. And this is how we do our, you know, uh, our sales motion. And these are the kind of sales people we hire, or these are the partners we sell through. And it's all kind of working as a sort of a smooth machine. And, you know, you can, you can press the, you know, press the gas from here and, and scale. That's to me is a, is a mature product market fit. And for most companies, it, you know, for app, for app dynamics and harness, I had that feeling only once we hit like around, you know, somewhere in the five to $10 million kind of revenue. That, and by that time, it, it was clear, like, this is how we're going to, our sweet spot is, this is how we're going to sell it. This is how we're going to accelerate. And then you are ready to press the gas. Then you want to move fast and kind of, you know, go, uh, go and, you know, try to capture as much of the market. Definitely. There's some great nuggets here. I'm typing them as I go along. You know, I usually don't, don't live type uh, very rarely. And this is coming from the heart and I love it. Um, so when you talk about mature product market fit and adding the GTM as a part of it, at, you know, to get to 5, 10 million, because this is, this is a very important thing. I, I had an advisor in my previous company that failed. He asked me to see the marketing plan. I put this marketing plan with so many channels in there. And then... Uh, uh, his name was Hiten Shah. <laughs> he, he sank in the in the in the seat, and he said, "Just burn these slides." 
he's like if you don't focus on one thing you're going to fail you're chasing like somebody saying yeah. implement on spot somebody saying be on social you're running so what does that look like you know when you got to 10 million in app dynamics how many mm-hmm. channels were activated or you know because a lot of advisors will come and say hey i don't see you on clubhouse and then you know founder sometimes will go and run to club like what what does that look like is it one channel one customer or is it well i think you got to be a little bit more uh, analytical about it in my experience like numbers and measure it so you know especially when it comes to marketing you know you can measure like you know it, it's easy to experiment like say someone says hey you should have ads on linkedin or maybe you should be in on clubhouse and that will drive leads to you so you experiment with it you put in maybe spend like a you know thousand dollars to put some some ads on uh, our campaigns on linkedin let's say and experiment and see what the results are and was it working or not and then you increase on things so i think experiments are totally fine but your investment should be driven by data after that marketing otherwise you can burn so much money and so much dollars you know when it comes to you know so uh, so obviously there is a brand right brand is a little bit un- you can't measure easily the what will drive brand right so brand you know is just a sh- you have to create your share of voice you are in uh, yeah or for, for your company or for your business but when it comes to generating leads and demand in business the more measured and analytical and numbers oriented you are you know the better it is and i would strongly encourage hire people in marketing who are numbers people on that front you know you will have like a lot of great marketers who can't understand the numbers and the imp- and the like what will drive leads and like i've put in 10000 dollars into this channel would it generate me this much uh, you know leads or not uh, you know that's how you have to operate that and it's you know it, it, it you won't know like every business is different every every company is different like you know what would work you know to drive your leads is you experiment quickly and then you double down on what's working and you measure and measure and measure and hold your marketing org accountable for that definitely no that is that is well said so then does the same principle apply because you said two thirds this time one third the next time so you mm-hmm. two third you just basically what i'm hearing constantly is nail it and then scale it so maybe two third mm-hmm. scaling yep. the content maybe spend some time figuring out the next uh-huh. sort of, um let's go into J, into into the next top point you had mentioned gtm and sales execution i want to cover all your points because it's it's super valuable um what does top gtm and sales execution look like when did you at app dynamics decide i need to i've done founder sales enough i got to find somebody <laughs> else and what what does that look like yeah i think that's the you know i what i realized was like you know selling into enterprises uh is there is a science to it and you know if you don't know it you really can't be very good at it like you know so uh, i uh, my advice to most founders is like you know try if you don't have experience with sales try to bring in someone who has experience with it and kind of either learn from them or let them do it you know someone who is really good at it so uh, you know uh, when i was doing app dynamics people would be like you know oh don't hire a vp of sales hire a sales rep to do things and i was like i i can but i don't know what to do here <laughs> i don't even know how to hire a sales rep i don't even know how to interview them at this right now so i would rather have someone who has done the vp of sales or this job before if i can afford to like you know if you have kept, you are you are funding to afford to bring someone my advice to most founders is try to bring someone who's the the most capable most experienced and ideally who have done that job before in another startup uh, you know if some then you are reducing the risk on it so that's uh, you know and i in hindsight i feel that was the best uh, decision i made like you know that i i when we were like very very small at abdanamics like you know just first five customers which i did founder sales i was like let me try to bring in someone who has done this job before and you know i was able to bring someone as a vp of sales to do that and that really helped because that's you know i was able to build a strong sales function but at any point of time like once you know you have to make sure that you do you have the the right people in sales leadership do you have the right people in your you know are they doing sales execution right same thing on the marketing like it's there's alignment between marketing and sales do you have the demand generation models working and you have to the, the, you know when you say okay how do you do world class job at it i uh, the bar i look at is like you know i used to what what i normally go and tell our sales people in that is like you know imagine our product is bad our product is not a good product can you sell just on the strength of sales uh, that our sales execution is so good that we could still find a lot of deals and sell by the way I, i say the same thing to the product team i said imagine our sales sucks <laughs> we sell can, can we sell because our product is so good that people will buy because that imagine our sales is really bad and like you know can we sell just because our product is so good and you know i 
that's to me then it becomes you know both becomes your competitive advantages both are meeting that bar like you know our product is shooting for imagine our sales is bad and but our product has to be so good that people will still buy and our sales people are shooting the bar for imagine our product is bad we are so good in in in, in sales execution that you know we could still sell it then you have you have kind of achieved a very it's a multiplying effect of it is very very you know very high uh, so you have to push for it like you have to try to hire the best you know experienced sales leaders uh, you know you have to create the culture of like you know encouraging them uh, uh, you know you have to provide them the right resources you know you have to a lot of companies and startups i feel you know under value focus on sales and marketing uh, and uh, it takes some time to learn like you know you, you got to focus on that like you know you can build the best product but without it without good sales and marketing you still not going to get in front of everyone that it all comes down to focusing on that definitely now when you hire people early on there are times you run into situations where they were the right people for the company at that time but mm-hmm. then you sort of outgrow them maybe your first vp of sales you have outgrown uh-huh. how do you handle situations like that how do you have that conversation who do you bring <laughs> at the right time like you know at at sort of series a b <laughs> you know I, I so i would say the the hardest thing a startup founder ceo have to do is that that is one of the hardest decisions you have to make and you make and you have to kind of go through those transitions like you know the people who are like you know you you hire someone at say you know zero to a million dollars of revenue uh, you know in say vp of sales or vp of marketing or vp of customer success or all, all different kind of functions you know many of them would not be able to scale after say 10 15 million of revenue you know and someone you hire at like you know some would some would and you want them to some that you hire at 10 15 million of revenue may not scale beyond 60 70 million of revenue right so the main things that change is like when you're very early it's all about how fast and scrappy you are when you are getting bigger you also want the ability to plan and have the right strategy because you are fast and scrappy but you you have a wrong plan in place you're basically churning a lot of energy and resources right so the skills start to change a bit right and like you know ability to recruit becomes a big big skill you know as you, as you grow so it's it's just different things and as ceo is it's really hard like you know you hire someone who has worked with you in the trenches for for say 3 4 years and you've achieved to a certain state and for making the decision to bring someone else uh, and change them that's a very hard thing to do but as startup ceos you have to you know if and, and you and there's no formula like you know if someone is scaling or not like how do you judge it and i look at like you know what skills someone needs to get to the next level and are, do they have those skills are they coachable on those skills or and do we have a time as company to coach them like you know if we, we need those skills now and it will take a year for someone to be good at it we have a year to 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 wait like you know as as a company right that's that becomes a uh, becomes a factor it, it it's hard and sometimes you have to make very hard choices like you know these the people you work with they become your friends also and you know it's uh, replacing them with some some another exec uh, is 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 the hardest thing to do what any advice there on the type of conversation or how do you frame it or sometimes they know already right and and maybe other times they feel like hey i was slighted you know it, 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 sometimes they know yes most of the times they would know i i would say it's important to ha- keep having the conversation on like what is uh what we need as a company and also point out like you know what we are not getting as a company and you give them a bit of a chance to get there you know if they if they're not getting there is when you know because you don't want to do this lightly as well like you don't want to keep bringing you know new execs so you want to give your your, your current exec chance to to get there right you know and if they uh how how long of a chance you give depends on the state of your company right you know if you don't if you can't give someone a year to fix something because if in a year your company won't survive right so but in some cases you might be able to give up like you know shorter time longer time whatever right i think you just have to be open and upfront and it's there is no easy way to do it like you can't be beating around the bush you know you have to when you have to make the you know uh you when you get to the decision you have to be firm and decisive about it uh you know that's really the the advice i would i would i would give to someone i think for most ex- execs you want to look for people who make things look easy you know if they you would know like you know if they if they are drowning in it like you know they can't cope up with it what's the current state of it so then you know like you know they were good in up to now but now they are just really drowning in it and it's it uh, you know and the organization knows the rest of the company knows the rest of the team knows like you know this is a function that's kind of you know uh, struggling in some ways right so it's not it's never a surprise to the company in in, in my experience like you know when whenever you do that
Yeah, definitely. People, people can see the, you know, you don't have to ask what the person is doing. You can just watch the actions and, and tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. So then as you see these companies go from sort of idea to product market fit to mature product market fit and then hyperscale, um, who, what do you recommend for recruiting? Who in, at the seed stage do you see are the most important players to have? And then uh, sort of at the, next, at the next phase of scaling, who did you bring on? Seed stage is all about product to me. So, you know, you, you have to have the right product managers, uh, but the product managers in my, in, in, in my advice should be the founders. So like, you know, the founder should be the product. If you don't have founders who have that skill set, let's say, then you have to hire someone because if you, if you don't have the right product management discipline as the, as founders or, you know, you hire and bring the right people, you're not going to go anywhere. And then you have engineers who will build the product. So that's really the, the you know, you really need very, very solid engineers, people who can move fast, they can wear multiple hats, they are, you know, uh, they're not bogged down by process, uh, et cetera, you know, they're, uh, uh, you know, self-motivated. That's the kind of engineers you need in early on. And the third thing I, what I like to bring is like, you know, at least one person who can get me in front of customers, you know, it, uh, either the founder have that capability themselves or like, you know, someone who can just, you know, I really don't need to them to do anything in the meeting. I just need to get the meetings. Like, so as the founders, as who are the product managers can have a lot of customer conversations. So you can do the, find your product market fit, et cetera, right? At Unusual, we offer that as a service. Like we, that is the one of the key service we provide, like, you know, as part of uh, Unusual, because I always struggle with it. Like, you know, you know, people will, when I started, I've done people say, you have to find, you have to talk to, you know, 75 customers so that you can build the right product market fit. I was like, how do I get 75 customers to talk to? Like, I don't have, you know, I don't have that many people. I like, how would I find like the, you know, in, in, a, in a bank, uh, you know, in IT organization, in a bank, uh, someone to talk to. That's where that unusual we offer, we, that's what off, we provide as a service that we will create a machine like uh, that will call these people and get you these meetings so that you can talk to and find the right product market. Fit. So I really think only these three things are needed in the, in the seed stage and most B2B companies like, you know, the product management discipline, you know, who like what product to build and ideally founders should have it, engineers uh, and someone who can get you in front of customers so you can build the best product, product and find the best product, iterate it, find your design partners, et cetera. Everything else I would delegate and outsource out like operations and finance and legal and HR, like you shouldn't hire people at that seed stage. You, you, there are out, enough outsourcing uh, options to do that. As you start scaling beyond that, like, you know, at some point, I think the, once you have that initial product market fit start to happen, One million, yeah. bring sales, uh, you know, and uh, my advice to people is like, try to bring the most capable salesperson you can attract at that time. Like, you know, and who has gone through that stage before. Because you are reducing the risk on your business the most by, you know, so that's the, 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 the person I would say bring then, you know, marketing is next, like, you know, depending on what kind of company you are in, you know, you may need very strong marketing support. So I'll bring in a head of marketing. I would say then you can wait for the rest. You know, my advice to most people and what I like to do is like, you know, you can bring a, if you don't have the engineering management experience in the founding team, then bring a VP engineering once you are like maybe 30, 40, 50 engineers. Before that, you don't need a VP engineering before you have like uh, a smaller team, engineering team than that. You know, you bring in a VP of customer success kind of person. Once you have like 40, 50 customers, you most likely don't need someone, your engineering team and product team can do the, uh, you know, do that. You know, you don't need a VP level person. Uh, and then you kind of go from there, like, you know, the, 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 the finance and HR and operations, you can wait you know, until you are even bigger and then you kind of start bringing the, the execs uh, and a team uh, and leaders in, in those later. So if the founders don't have then the engineering management experience, you would still hire maybe like a director level person for a small engineer. Yes. Yeah. Right? If, yeah, I think, you know, if founders don't have it, then you have to like, you know, someone in the, the founding team has to manage your say first 10 engineers, right? You know, if they, it's a, uh, if any of the founders don't know how to manage the 10 engineers, uh, then yes, you have to bring someone. Definitely, because you know, I want to dive into this. It's a very important skill set for founders to have product management. What is good product management discipline? Because some founders sometimes, especially if they're coming from a non-product or engineering right. background, sales background, uh, then they say, build this and then build this. And like they, 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 it's just the scope creep keeps happening. <laughs> and so define good product management discipline. Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think to me, product management, 
the core of product management always comes with the product instinct. I have learned that like, you know, it's, it's, it's not that product management, you can like, it's not completely mathematical that you can just teach up to teach to anyone and they become a good product manager. So you have to have the right instinct of like, you know, what good products mean, like, you know, and they, and a lot of it comes from like, you know, putting ability to put yourself in the shoes of your con consumers, your end users. Like, can you understand from their, per, from their perspective, what things will look like? So, you know, a lot of times come from your domain expertise. Like, you know, that's where, say, if you, if, if you are domain expert in something that you have feel, felt that pain, you know, that pain, you can understand it. You can put yourself in the shoes of your users that create your a strong instinct on what a good solution to this problem would look like, because you're putting, you're thinking in, in from the point of view of the end user of the, of, of the consumer. So that's to me is the, is the foundation of it. You can teach everything else, but this you can't teach. Like if they don't have that instinct on what good product would, you know, and good experience in this particular problem domain would be, they really can't build good products. So that's the, to me is the, is the first part. Now, if you start becoming like math, like a bit like say more organized and scientific about it, like, you know, how do you prioritize you know, what to do and not chase the next shiny thing here and there? So I like to use a sort of a framework, you know, mental framework, which is like, you know, that there are four things you need to, to look in your, you know, your backlogs or like what you want to do, right? You know, it could be a very simple, you know, uh, spreadsheet initially or something, right? I look at like, you know, there, there are four buckets of things. One is what your customers are asking for. So your customers are asking for like, I have, you have this feature, but I need this feature. I, I can't deploy it. I can't use it. I can't get much adoption. I can't do that's like the one bucket of things. The second bucket of things is what your sales people are asking for. Your sales people are saying like, I, if you don't have this, we can't sell it. Like, you know, we have this deal coming in and this deal needs this feature or this competitor has this feature and we don't have this and we can't sell it. We are losing these deals, et cetera. Right. So that's your second bucket. Your third bucket is like, what your engineers are asking for, your engineers saying, Hey, we have this scalability issue, or we have this, you know, architectural problem here, and we need to rebuild this. And otherwise we, it won't work. And, you know, we'll have production outages to all sorts of things like, you know, and it's like technical debt, you have technical debt that is accumulated that your engineers want to work on. Right. So that's the third bucket. The fourth bucket is really actually not coming from these It's coming from the product management or the founders. Like what is the, the vision of your product? Are you making progress towards the vision of your product? And you have to have a, like, you know, where say, this is what you wanted to build to solve this problem and you have a conviction and vision around it. You still have to keep working towards it. Right. So I look at like, you know, you have to get a balance of these four in a, in a pretty organized manner. Like, you know, it's the, the, you know, and create a healthy tension around it. Like, you know, it's like, you know, so uh, I like to manage it in, 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 in app dynamics and harness and receivable. Like this is, these are your four lists. Like these are the ask from customers. These are ask from sales. These are the ask from, for our technical debt. And this is what we need to do. You know, what, and that, some of that has come from just the, the founders or product leaders' convictions on where the market is going and what we need to add to expand our time, like uh, you know, or add features to be competitive, etc. Right. So, and you always create those four, and you kind of go through, you know, a balance of like you know which ones you want to take on, and you know what what compromises you have to make. You know, if you take more of this versus more of that. And that's where the, the signs of prioritization in product management will come in. And that's where the discipline part is. Like the, the right founders should have some discipline around balancing this well and not just chasing things uh, here and there. Definitely, most definitely. And I, I, I love how you put it. Now, is the balance like 25, 25, 25 across the four? <laughs> I actually like that. I'm going to use it at, at, at my company too, uh, okay. because this is great advice. But how do you balance? Uh, it, you know, it could be 25, 25, 25, you know, uh, it could all, it could also be, sometimes it could change. Like sometimes like, okay, we are losing so many deals, uh, you know, uh, to our competitors because we don't have these capabilities. And maybe so the second bucket of what your salespeople need to win against those deals and competitors, maybe that takes 70% of your bandwidth for some period, right? You know, and maybe you are like losing your customers are churning because your customers are unhappy about something and you want to put a lot of your focus on the first bucket because th if you don't do those things, your churn is very high. So it's always not 25, 25, 25 like that. But yes, over a year period, it should be around that, you know, but in like, you know, you may have like periods of two months, three, four months where you're putting a lot of your energy and resources uh, in in one of the buckets based on what's 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 happening. Definitely. This is a good segue into your fourth point here. Take care of your customers. How do you take care of your customers? Uh, deliver them what you promised. To me, that is, it all comes down to that. Like, you know, because if you deliver what you promised, you'd really take care of them. And, and, you know, I always tell our teams, like, you know, anyone who's buying from a startup, 
they are putting their career online on the line by making a decision to buy from you like say if you know it's if say if someone in a company bought software from app dynamics or harness and you know and and we are a young startup and not too much you know uh, maturity in the market yet etc right if it doesn't work for them for their for their company that person may lose their job or may not get a promotion or may get like a you know bad performance review or they may not meet a okr or something so we, they are putting their job and their career and their uh, you know uh, their rep, maybe their reputation online buying from us so we have to make sure that we do the right thing for that person that who is buying from us right so and a lot of it comes down to we deliver what we promised on like what they wanted to achieve so in app dynamics we eventually got to the point of uh, you know making it systematic you know and same thing we are you know uh, doing at harness uh, as well uh, which is you know in our sales process we will do like a quick analysis called like business value analysis like this is the business value you're going to get if you buy app dynamics we'll say like you know this is how you do things now and this is how things you could do with app dynamics and this is the value you maybe you can quantify the value etc everything right so that every company does it like you know you build roi and all that things and we were doing like a business value analysis before the sale but we also started doing like you know after the sale like 6 months after the sale we will go and say okay let's do analysis of business value realization did you realize the value that you thought you would and it's it's our job to jointly get you there like you know for whatever reason if you want to realize that value that you thought efficiency or productivity will go up by this or our like you know time to do x task will go down by this or whatever it was right the value you thought you will achieve have you achieved it or not if you've not not achieved it it's our job to get you there or help you in whatever ways to get you there and if you get your customers to achieve the value that you promised or they wanted to you have taken care of them i think at that point you know they are good like they were they, they will get a promotion in their job you know they will get like you know they could be your advocates they could be a champions and you know that's that's that to me is the way to get there now coming back to the last point tell us about like building that winning culture focus on the right culture in the company yeah i think well i don't think there is one culture that is necessarily the winning culture you have to as my main belief is that as founders you have to be a bit deliberate about culture yeah. people people go and say like you know oh culture is what forms like you can't you know shape it but that, i don't agree with that you can shape the culture you have to be like you know what kind of culture you would like like you know if you look at uh, google a very different culture than amazon or very different culture than apple but they're all successful companies but you have to have what your if what culture you want to create right and be deliberate about it right so the culture that i like to create is that it's uh, it's very open and uh, it's very collaborative it's very data oriented it's very transparent uh, you know if we are ambitious risk taking kind of culture that you shoot for big goals and like you know and be very open about it if you don't meet it it's fine like you know you just are open and transparent about it and very uh, empowering as well like you know you just empower people you hire smart people and let them run with things but you create transparency and accountability and measurability around around all of those so that so that's the culture that i i like to build and that's the culture i would like to operate it doesn't mean like that is the only culture that could you know that's that 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 would work but that's the culture uh Uh, for me the the ideal culture would be the, the thing i i do like to do is like you know a lot of people talk about you know how do you find culture fit when you hire you know are you hiring a lot of people how do you uh, you know in, interview for culture fit and I, i i tell our teams don't interview for culture fit 100% it, it's it, that whole concept of interviewing for culture fit like hr person asking someone like oh would you fit our culture to me is that just nonsense that doesn't make any sense so means like can we teach them to operate in our culture are they coachable uh, you know who you have like if someone worked at apple they worked in a very different culture is very secretive this and that if someone worked at google they worked in a very open culture so how would would you judge them that you know what culture they are from that person is from no like because that's a company they work for that was the company culture so now when we hire them at harness or abdynamics to me it's not about what culture they previously worked on is like are they ready to be to learn and embrace and adapt harness culture and in the interview process we tell them that this is our culture is so for you to be successful at harness these are the cultural values or this is how we operate and you teach them and you teach them and you kind of educate them again and again and people like to operate that and you exhibit it like you know people who do these cultural values are the ones who are getting promotions or the ones who are getting like you know 
more responsibility, etc. And people will just adapt your culture. That's how you kind of strengthen your culture more and more over time, right? Definitely. You know, the other day I put a LinkedIn post where it almost went viral. I put culture fit is the biggest BS trope in the history of business. You know, you don't, <laughs> yeah. you don't need to hire people that you can go drinking with, right? Um, I, 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 you need people to align with your, with your values. There's a couple of questions here I want to take. Is, uh, is one on your... Um, on your revenue at app dynamics right did you how did you think about shifting pricing strategies to get to 250 million arr at app dynamics we didn't really shift it like you know you want to you know the, the one mistake i feel startups do is to price too low so the fun thing i would say like if you want to build a big business uh, don't price too low create value like you know and create a way to justify value like and then i started app dynamics as an engineer and first time i was like you know asking someone for a million dollars like i would be just scared of even thinking about it like you know how can we ask for a million dollars but if you're selling to a large bank where have they have like a you know 10 billion dollars of it budget and you can help them save like 100 million dollars a year or something like that like asking them a few hundred million dollars is a very justifiable thing so you have to almost make your pricing align with the value that you will create for someone and, you know, it's people will pay, like, you know, if you're going to save someone, you know, $100 million, can you ask for $2 million a year, $3 million, $5 million a year? Can you justify that value? You probably, you can. So you have to create the pricing that is aligned for what the value pe- the, your customer perceives, right? So, you know, and uh, that would be my one advice on the, on, the, on the pricing. It's not about like, you know, changing the pricing. You just have to align your pricing with the value someone is going to get out of. One of our most regular uh, attendees, Akilan, asked, how, have you, how did you attract your seed investment for App Dynamics? How did that happen? <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. So, you know, in those times, the definition of seed was different. Like, you know, what we call seed today was called Series A that time. You know, it was $5 million Series A. These days, $5 million is, is, a, is, a, is a seed investment. Uh, but it was very hard. Like, I was a first-time found, uh, founder, engineer turned founder. You know, I pitched to you know, at least 30 or so VCs, most of them turned me down at that time. You know, people were like, you know, you are sole founder, we don't invest in sole founders, or you are, you don't have any business experience, you know, you have to, you know, we don't invest in that, we think the market is too small, all kind of things you deal with, right, you know, and it's just okay, like, you know, all of those rejections, you learn from it. And it took me like, almost 30 rejections before I got my first term sheet uh, uh, to do that. So it wasn't easy, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, to get the first funding for, for, for app dynamics. First funding for Harness was extremely easy. Like I had like 30 VCs pitching me, take our money, take our money, take our of money. Course. <laughs> so, so that was a different story, but you know, the abdomics wasn't easy. And, and then in a, in a way, as a founder, you're doing sales as well, right? Like you're selling, pitching to investors, leveraging your network, cold emailing. You know, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Do you want to pick one question here? There's so many questions. I think a lot we covered as we went through yeah. your journey, but yeah. maybe you pick one question you like here. <laughs> as sort of speakers pick. Sure. How do you do equity valuation when pre-sales from zero to one? Yeah, let's take the, that. The, the valuation at that stage from zero to one, pre-product market fit, pre-traction, you know, anyone who tells you that there's a numbers equation behind that is just uh, bullshitting you. <laughs> there is no, there is no numbers thing at that point. It's like, you know, investors want to have a certain ownership in the companies. And then beyond that is just demand supply. Like, you know, how competitive the the deal is, you know, how, how, you know, how much interest there would be in that particular company, that particular founding team, but you really don't have metrics. And I, I, I almost think like any investor who's too focused on metrics in the zero to one stage is really not the right person at that stage. You know, you, you have a lot of investors who are focused on a lot of metrics from like, you know, your CAC ratio and all sort of things, right? They don't apply in zero to one. Zero to one is all about, is the market problem important and large? You know, it, it, do you have the product market fit and the right product uh, differentiation to, to address that? And is a team good? Is is team strong? Is, is this the winning team, right? So and it, that's what people would, investors should be looking at, nothing else. Metrics doesn't matter in the zero to one at that point. And then you just, you know, how competitive the deal would be. So if you're a founder and you want to get the best valuation, make it competitive. Don't, you know, pitch to more investors, get more offers. Don't make it just one or two. The more competitive it is, you know, the, the likely the higher valuation you're going to get. Definitely. Uh, one, one question here was what does unusual look for? And I think, you know, I, I guess, is that why you named the company uh, yeah. venture fund unusual because you were unusual in a way, single founder, <laughs> time entrepreneur. No, it, it, well, that is part of it. Like, you know, there is a bit of like, you know, uh, but it's not that because unusual ventures is unusual. Our approach is unusual. You know, our approach at unusual is 
to really help founders in that zero to one stage. And we almost like, you know, specialize in that by providing very, very deep help in that. So like if you uh, take capital from unusual, we provide, if we become your acting VP of sales, we become your acting VP of marketing, we become your acting VP of recruiting. So we help you with the functions you, you don't have likely have experience as founders at that stage. And you don't have the ability to recruit those people at that stage because they don't want to join you. And, and now like, how would you hire a good VP of sales before you have any revenue traction? So we become your acting VP of sales at that point so that we can get you to the revenue traction. And so, which is a very different model than any venture fund. And I wanted to do it based on my experiences myself. Like, you know, it's like, what would I gotten, you know, uh, most help out of at AppDynamics or Harness or like, you know, from VCs at that stage. It's like someone just gets in the trenches and help me things that, and do things that I don't know how to do well, or I can't even hire people to do that well at this stage, because that will change the, the you know, our trajectory significantly. So that's, it's a very unusual approach and unusual model. And that's why we call it unusual. But we also look for unusual founders. Like, you know, that's also part of it. Like, you know, we like high diversity, you know, all kind of backgrounds. We don't follow like one, any kind of a specific formula. So that's definitely part of our, our model as well. Yeah, definitely. So do you invest in post-product sort of pre, <coughs> pre-revenue startups at all? Yes, we do. We do. So we, we look for that. Well, those ones, yes, you know, if the post-product, post, you know, uh, early revenue, we look at, you know, still we are looking at the product market fit. We're still looking at the team. We're still looking at like, you know, the, the the market opportunity. But at that point, you start looking at also the ability to execute, like, you know, what are we seeing? Like, are the customers happy? Are the, you know, is is, uh, is the founding team uh, learning to execute on say, go to market and sales? Because the best founding team will be like, you know, extremely good in the product and their domain but their ability to learn, go to market and sales, uh, that's the, so, you know, so if you're starting to get there, you want to see that, like, is this team exhibiting those signs, right? So, and you start seeing those, uh, you know, if the, and normally our sweet spot at Unusual, we normally invest only in like seeds or like early series A's. We don't do like, you know, uh, beyond that. We don't, we're not growth investors. Awesome. It was a great session. It was free advisory for me as well as I aspire to be Jyoti <laughs> Bansal here. Um, as you look back on your journey, what do you wish you did more of? And what do you wish you did less of? Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, let's say in many ways content on the in the journey on it. I would say like, you know, when I started at Dynamics, uh, I wished I had better understanding of investors and VCs and managing board. And I spent a lot of time doing that, like, you know, I wish I didn't have to, like, you know, I like to spend time building products and competing in the market, not too much on the, you know, managing your investors and board, et cetera. So that's something I wish I had to do less. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing less of that now. So that is, that is, uh, that is good to me. It's it, what my passion is, is actually product. I like building good products, like excellent products and going after markets, you know, that's what I thrive in. So I would like to do, want to do more and more of that that I could build really, really good products and, you know, and build more products to the market that solves pain and problem areas that I'm interested in. That's so, you know, it's, that's what I would, you know, want to do more and more. Of. Definitely. Thank you so much, Jyoti. You're such a humble human being. You're one of the best entrepreneurs I met. Wishing you great success, wishing, wishing you many, many, many more unicorns, not stopping at Harness, but Traceable and everything else. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful hey. weekend coming up. Always great to talk to you, Lloyd. Thank you.